Thank you. Yes, um, I know my writing is bad, so there are a set of lecture <laughs> notes coming out. Um, actually, these are notes which of a talks I gave in Brazil quite a long while ago, but they still hold, except they don't talk about inflation, but you're getting inflation from other people in this course. And now just to remind you, the metric we use in cosmology, ds squared is minus dt squared, there's a time, a universe of time in cosmology, the scale factor, and what I should have emphasized, if you look at this metric, this spatial part, there is no time in there. The only place the time occurs is in the scale factor. And that's why it is the scale factor, is because in this metric, that is the only place where time occurs. This is all just spatial stuff, and I discussed it yesterday. The fluid motion is delta A zero is one zero, zero. And what that means is in space-time, we have our surfaces... T is constant. These are preferred surfaces associated with the preferred velocity, which is orthogonal, and so we have our preferred motion of matter in the universe, as I discussed with you yesterday. Now, we were talking about matter and the thermal history. And my problem here is there's a huge amount of physics to do with the thermal history. What we discovered was for matter... <coughs> For matter, the density is a constant over a cubed conservation of matter. For radiation, the density is a constant over A to the fourth, which implies that the temperature uh, scales is 1 over A of T. Uh, and we did both of those last time. Now, this, as I said last time, says that we have a hot Big Bang, and basically... In the universe, if we plot the scale factor as a function of time, the scale factor over today's value, and we have the temperature, and we're going to take the logarithm of the temperature, we have a logarithmic scale with the temperature today being 3 degrees Kelvin, today being the background radiation temperature, and as you go back, the temperature in principle diverges. As the temperature diverges, the energy density diverges. So we have another graph here, which is the energy density, the logarithm, over the scale factor A over A naught. And um, that is a slope minus 1, corresponding to 1 over A. Now, this one, this is um, the temperature going as 1 over A to the fourth of the radiation. Uh, the matter goes... Well, all right, now... Now, what I need to do, and it's laid out in these notes, but what we need to do is to notice the main physics things that happen as we go back. And there's a series of physics things that happen as we go back in the universe from today to earlier and earlier times. And the first thing that happens is the photon energy, the photon energy becomes greater than the binding energy of anything. So you take any structure you like. Take an atom. As you go back, we exceed the binding energy of the atom at about 4,000 degrees. Atoms become ions. The ions and the electrons are then freely, and so the universe becomes a plasma. So atoms go to ions plus electrons. In other words, the universe becomes a plasma at about a temperature of 4,000 degrees. Okay, the nuclei get broken up into protons and neutrons at about 10 to the 8th degrees. The protons and neutrons get broken up into quarks. And so on. Anything that you think of has got a binding energy. And when the temperature of the universe gets bigger than that binding energy, it's going to get split into its parts. And so as we go back, the universe at recent times has got all these molecules that we see around us here. Go back, oh, sorry, I should have said, yeah, uh, molecules go to atoms as you exceed the binding energy of the molecules. The atoms get broken up into um, ions and electrons. The nuclei get broke, which are the, uh, the nuclei get broken up into protons and neutrons the protons and neutrons into quarks, and if quarks are made of any subparticles, those will get broken up as well because you exceed the binding energy. So as you go back, the universe 
gets made up of simpler and simpler things, more and more elementary particles. That's point number one. Point number two is at these temperatures, we have thermal equilibrium of the plasma. Now, that's because the ionization time, the time for, ion, uh, the, the time for interaction is much less than the time for expansion. And you have to put in the numbers to check that out. You have to look at the rate at which the universe is expanding. And even though at very early times it's expanding very fast, the interactions you're concerned with at those times are even faster. And so what you get is thermal equilibrium of the plasma with a changing temperature. Okay? Because the, 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 the uh, collisions are so fast that they bring you into thermal equilibrium. Now, that has a very, very nice feature because what it means is you don't have to know the previous history of the universe. Um, supposing, supposing for the moment, that in fact, I have assumed up there that the scale factor just increases with time from zero. And we we'll talk about this shortly when we get to the field equations. But supposing there was a bounce, supposing there was a bounce from a very big temperature, we drop to some temperature and then go back up again. Sorry, the scale factor drops to a small factor and then back up. What would happen to the temperature? The temperature would drop from low to a maximum and then go back down again. The temperature wouldn't be monotonic anymore. It would um, reach a minimum and go back up. It doesn't matter what you throw in beforehand, provided your temperature gets high enough, everything you throw in gets broken down. And so it doesn't matter what you throw in beforehand, you get an equilibrium mixture. One of the great features of equilibrium, it's highly unique. You just need to know the temperature and what the mixture of particles are, and you know what the equilibrium result is. And so, it, yeah. Yeah, may I, may I interrupt? Yes. Okay. Well, except, you know, because it was back of the envelope, I got 5,000 degrees. Okay. Yeah. But it's the same calculation yeah. that Professor Ellis is talking about. And also, to make sure the students um, are not confused, I unfortunately use a different notation from Professor Ellis. So what Professor Ellis calls the scale factor is A of T, or A of temperature, is what I call capital R yesterday. Capital? And roughly called the radius L. of the okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, when I was young, it was called R of T for the radius factor. Right. Uh, it became S of T for the scale factor. One of the things you have to get used to in physics is changing notation. <laughs> so I'm, obviously, I'm older than you. <laughs> um, okay. Now, so it doesn't matter what you threw in. You get thermal equilibrium. Now, then, what becomes now really important is you have a kind of a problem. Because your radiation scales as 1 over A. If you take a simple model of matter, atomic, monatomic gas, the temperature of the matter scales as 1 over A squared for a simple monatomic gas. We can have a big argument about whether that's a good approximation, but the key point here is this isn't the same as that. So now we have a kind of a theoretical problem. Your matter wants to go at one temperature, the radiation wants to go at a different temperature, but they're in equilibrium with each other. So what happens? Which one wins? And the answer is the radiation wins because if you calculate the thermal capacity of the radiation, it is hugely greater than the thermal capacity of the matter. Now that's a really astonishing result because we had to do incredibly delicate measurements to measure the microwave background radiation. We had to use our best detectors, supercooled, and we find this three degrees incredibly low. If you just use standard gas laws and calculate, you find the amount of heat in the radiation is about 10 to the eighth times the amount of heat in the matter. Now, why is that? For the very simple reason, this radiation fills the whole of space where the matter is concentrated in tiny clumps. And so it's because the mat, the radiation is everywhere that the radiation wins out. And the temperature of the matter, when they're in equilibrium, is equal to the temperature of the radiation, and they go as 1 over A. So that is then a really important point to notice, that the matter and radiation, because they're in equilibrium, the temperatures have to be same. And so which one wins? Well, the answer is the radiation wins. Okay, now, the third point is pair production. 
And the point here is that there is a rest mass energy for every particle. And as the temperature goes up, what you will be getting is you will be getting photons colliding with other photons. And when the energy is high enough, the rest mass energy will be exceeded. And so, for instance, you will get electron-positron pair production taking place when you exceed that temperature, which is of the order of 10 to the 10. A little bit higher, you will get proton-antiproton. Higher, you will get... Think of any particle pairs you like. As the temperature goes up, you will exceed the rest mass energy or whatever you think of, and you will get pair productions of those particles. Now, what this means over here is that in this temperature as a function of time, there's actually a little step in there, because... As you come down in temperature, the inverse process takes place. As you come down in temperature, what happens is the electrons and the protons collide and give you photons. So the matter feeds into the radiation, and there is, in fact, a little step here which shifts you from one curve here to a slightly different curve. Okay? Um, oh, now... As this, I'm trying to summarize a huge amount of physics in a very short time. Um, yes, sorry, one thing I should have added about thermal equilibrium up here is even neutrinos are in equilibrium at a high enough temperature, um, T greater than about, let's say, 10 to the 11th K. I'm just giving you rough temperature scales. That's a truly extraordinary statement if you think how difficult it is to measure neutrinos. They go through the Earth without being noticed, all the rest of it. At high enough temperatures, the neutrinos themselves come into equilibrium as well. Now, the consequence is that as you come down, the photons are giving you a photon background here. The neutrinos... There is, in fact, a neutrino background as well as a photon background. And the neutrino background is at about 1 degree K, a little bit lower because of this step here. So if you could detect neutrinos, and this is now would be one of the great experiments of cosmology, verifying the standard of model, if you could do it, as well as being embedded in the sea of photons, we're embedded in the sea of neutrinos, background neutrinos coming from the very, very early stage of the universe. The temperature is incredibly low, so detecting them is... I'm not an expert. I just would take it as impossible. <laughs> but um, if you could measure it, there are these neutrinos floating around cut through the whole universe as well as the photons. Okay, now. So what we get is we get equilibrium abundances. Equilibrium abundances of particles as we at each temperature in the very, very early universe. Um, and the fourth and final kind of thing that I need to mention, and you will hear much more about this from other people than from me, but I just want to mention it, forces will be unified at high enough temperatures. The electric and the electromagnetic force and the weak force will be unified at the electro-weak force early enough. That will be presumably unified with the strong force early enough and at even earlier times the gravitational force. Now, I'm not going to discuss this here. I'm just saying that this is one of the things that will happen because in the early universe, every temperature, as long as there is an initial singularity, which I will discuss shortly, every temperature you can think of is exceeded. And so every branch of physics through atomic and <laughs> elementary particle physics to quantum gravity will be called into play unless we avoid the singularity. So that's a really important question. Okay, so now, as we go forward in time, we've been thinking of going backward time. As we go forward in time, everything will happen in reverse. Uh, the neutrinos will decouple. Shortly thereafter, the electron-positron uh, electron pairs will feed into photons. And then at about 10 to the 8th degrees K, we get nucleosynthesis. And this is one of the great achievements of nuclear physics combined with cosmology in the mid-1960s, 1970s, in which going forward in time, basically uh, uh, the, the simple elements combine to give you, um, to give you simple molecules. And um, this has been... Uh, discussed in enormous detail 
Um, the basic kind of reaction is uh, a proton plus a neutron giving you deuterium plus a photon, and then deuterium plus deuterium giving you helium-3 plus a neutron, and then um, helium-3 plus a uh, deuteron giving you helium-4 plus a neutron. 